Hi, welcome to the second module on probability theory. This module we would be trying to define probability in mathematical terms and trying to understand in mathematical terms. We will also see how we could probably calculate probability based on the different approaches to probability. So how do we define probability? We had already defined probability of an event as the number or the measure of the relative likelihood that event would happen given a few opportunities of happening. So the probability of event A is denoted by P of A, where A is the event, and it must lie within the interval 0 to 1. So this was what we saw in the previous module, that P of A lies between 0 and 1, and if P of A is equal to 0, then the event could not happen, and if P of A equal to 1, then the event is certain that it would happen. Mapping it on to a real number line between 0 and 1, we have probability lying between 0, 0.0 and 1.0. We've just made markings at 0.1 intervals, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.56, etc. So when you say 0.5, that's equal chance that the event would happen or the event would not happen. If you look at the extreme on the left, it means that the event will not happen, which is again a form of certainty. Let's say, for example, what is the chance the sun would not set today? Oh, zero percent chance because it would set, right? So that being the case, this is certainty. The other extreme on the right, this again means the probability is one, which means there is certainty. Again, the same question in a different form. What's the probability the sun would raise tomorrow morning? That's 100% sure. So which means it will happen. There's no chance that it will not happen. So any event which falls between these two limits of 0 and 1 are called as probability. The extremes or certainty. Well, technically the Definition says it's between 0 and 1, both inclusive, although the practical application does not make any sense. When something results in 0, probability results in 0, it becomes certainty. And when probability results in 1, again it becomes certainty, which defies the understanding of the uncertainty. Well, a small recap on what experiment outcome and events were. So experiment is a process that leads to one of several possible observations and whose outcomes are uncertain. A sample space is a collection of all the possible outcomes of a given random experiment. And an outcome is that particular result of an experiment, a singular element. While an event is a collection of one or more outcomes of the experiment with a common characteristic. A simple example, picking students for volunteering work from your class. So that's going to be an experiment because you do not know the outcome of the experiment as they are uncertain as to who would be picked. The sample space is all the students in your class constitutes the sample space and picking only one student becomes an outcome. And if you pick students with the first name Rauda, then that becomes an event. How do we write probability? Conditions of writing probability. If let's say E is an experimental outcome, that's E constitutes picking a student with first name Radha, then P of E denotes the probability E will occur, the probability of picking a student with first name Radha. Conditions say probability lies between 0 and 1, and if P of E equal to 0, it would never happen, and E equal to 1 certainly happen. Also note that the sum of all the probabilities of a particular experimental outcome would total to 1. In the sense, what is the chance of all of them happening? So if you add individually, they sum to 1. We also saw some equally likely probabilities, rolling a die. There are six possible outcomes. Now what's the probability I get a 2? 2 happens only once, and that's 1, over total outcomes, or 6, over 6. So that's 0 0.1667, about 16.67%. Well, how about the probability of 3, 4, 5, 
6 or 1? Well, they can give the same answer, 1 over 6, 1 over 6. They are equally likely. If you add each of them, the total of all the probabilities, you get it 6 over 6, that's 1. So sum of all probabilities equal to 1. Well, when assigning probabilities, there are different types and ways by which we could assign probabilities. Here's a small schematic understanding. Probability could be approached in two ways, an objective way and a subjective way. Subjective is subjected to individual preferences and choices. So it's based on the available information about the events that a person has. While objective remains same for people because it's objective, it could be classified into two types, either classical probability or empirical probability. Empirical probability is based on relative frequencies and long-run probabilities. Classical probability is based on equally likely outcomes. So the rolling of a die was equally likely and it is based on classical probability. Let's get to look what each of them mean and how do we understand each. Objective is not based on anybody's beliefs, ideas or understanding while it is the same for all people. It remains to be the same whoever calculates or finds. And they are based on equally likely if it's classical and based on long run relative frequency if it's empirical. However, subjective probability is based on your own belief, experiences, intuition, judgment, prejudice, expertise, etc. It would differ for individuals. So let's say what's the chance that the new iPhone would be a success? Somebody who likes iPhone would say 100%. However, somebody who doesn't like an iPhone would say about 20%. So that differs. It's subjective. Let's get to look at each one of them in detail. The three ways are classical probability based on equally likely, empirical based on past events or collection of data, and subjective based on one's own understanding and available information. The classical approach is one which looks at the sample space, wherein the sample space is predetermined. So you may probably not need to do the experiment to find the probability of each event. This refers to as a priori. So you can assign probabilities even before the event is observed. These are based on logics and they are not based on experience. So a simple example would be about understanding the die. You know that the die has six sides and you know that the probability of each could be estimated even before performing the experiment. Well, let's take a little more complex understanding. If you want even numbers, that's the probability of even numbers, you know there are three even numbers. So that's three out of six possible outcomes, so which can be determined even before rolling the die. So another example. If you're rolling two dice, you know there are two dice, each with six faces. So six times six is 36 possible events, and all equally likely. And what's the probability of getting a seven? There are six different ways you can get seven. One comma six, two comma five, three comma four, four comma three, five comma two, six comma one. So there are six different ways of 37, 36 possibilities, and hence that's about 16% chance of getting a seven. Now, these probabilities are calculated a priori, and such calculations are normally called as classical approaches, because one could easily construct the entire sample space of rolling two dice and find out the probabilities for any of the combinations that may be required, as shown in the Venn diagram here. The next is the empirical approach of the objective approach to probability. Now, when you say empirical, it basically is collection of real-time data or past data. And we look at the relative frequency of a particular event happening over the total number of events that have happened in the sample space. So estimating the amount of default rates on student loans. So you do not know the sample space and you may not be able to estimate unless and until you collect data. 
So what's the probability that a student defaults? The number of defaulters over the total number of students who have taken a loan. So that's favorable events over total events. Number of defaults over number of loans. This type of approach is normally used when there are no proper understanding or knowledge of the events that could happen. And as the number of observation increases, the estimation of the probability becomes more and more accurate. So the more the data, more the number of times data has been collected, or the amount of time the data has been collected would influence the actual probability. So let's take an example here. A space shuttle Columbia exploded in a very big disaster in 2003. It was the second disaster, and there were about 123 space missions that NASA had done. Now, based on this information, this has been collected. What is the chance that the next mission would be a success? Now, there were uh, 123 uh, missions that had happened, of which two failed. So 121 of them were a success. So the probability of success is the number of success flights that we have had and the total number of flights that have been done. So that's 121 successful flights over 123 total flights. So that's about 98% chance that the next flight would be a success. Empirical probability also relies uh, heavily on large amount of numbers because it depends on the amount of data that has been collected. So it's based on the law of large numbers. So what is this law of large numbers? It says over a large number of trials, the empirical probability of an event will approach its true value. Well, let's take a simple example. Supposing you toss a coin and the first 10 trials. In the 10 trials, you get a chance of head to be 20% and 80% tails. So does that mean that the chance of head is 20%? No, let's move it on to 50 times. As you keep on flipping the number of times and then you find that the probability of a head approaches 50%. So as n becomes larger and larger, the probability tends to become its true value. You could probably try it at home with your friend. Ask her to toss a few times. You also toss a few times. And you find that when you toss for very small amount of times, the ratio becomes 1 is to 3 or 10 is to 22 or 28 into 50 while over 1,000 trials or over 10,000 trials or over 100,000 trials, the probability reaches its original value. In this case, it's about 10 tosses. You can see the graph going over 60, 50%. For 20 flips, closer. For 50 flips, even more closer. When you do about 500 flips, it is almost close to 50%. So that's the law, law of large numbers. The last of the types of probability is the subjective approach. It reflects somebody's understanding, belief, expertise, knowledge, etc. And there is no repeatable random experiment in this particular case. Say, for example, what could be the return on the investment made by a particular industry? Well, they were not going to be repeating the same investment over periods of time. Or what could be the chance of success of a particular launch of a product? they would not be repeating the launch of the same product again. So in such cases, we need uh, expert opinion or personal judgments or the judgments based on the knowledge and understanding and experience of a particular type of process people have been through. So subjective probability is the likelihood of a particular event happening that was assigned by an individual based on how much of information the individual has. Here, information doesn't mean external alone, the knowledge, understanding, expertise, etc. So if there is no past experience, then the probability of a particular event needs to be estimated using subjective measures. Let's say, what's the chance that the US budget deficit would reduce to half in the next eight years? So then that's based on subjective understanding. A small summary again on the three different approaches. An empirical approach is based on data that has been collected over a period of time. So it has been found that 
2% chance that somebody would get a twin. So this needs to be done over a few years to find out the probability of having a twins. How many people had twins of the total number of births that happened. Classical, 50% probability of a head in a coin flip, and that can be estimated a priori using logic. Does not require one to perform the experiment time and again. Subjective, what's the chance of the pound gaining after the Brexit? Oh, that's subjective because it depends on the understanding of economics, the understanding of political, geographical, and business-related information that one particular has. Thank you for watching this.